Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Temenos Academy. As you know, we're an invisible college. We float from place to place, and tonight we've alighted at the Royal Asiatic Society for Good Hospitality. We're very grateful. Um, it's always a huge pleasure to introduce Jeremy Reed, um, a poet and lecturer who really needs no introduction. Over the past year or so, I've been refreshing my awareness of Jeremy's work, and I have read, um, I think, around 45 volumes of his poems, extending from the 1970s up to the present. Um, Jeremy's work is continually fresh, continually varied in form, amazingly original in discovering vivid and illuminating imagery. Um, to my mind, he is the important poet of my generation, and I'm delighted to be with him tonight. So, Jeremy tonight is commemorating, um, celebrating, mourning, dramatising a year since the death of David Bowie, and his talk is, appropriately enough, entitled Starman. Thank you, you. <coughs> Starman. At 4 p.m. in January, the Soho sky, smeared by pollution as an additive, turns optimal cobalt, or on my favourite Faro and Ball colours chart, black blue, underlit by drizzled haze. I'm writing Starman at Patisserie Valerie in Old Compton Street, a residual bohemian cafe that David Bowie would use for intermittent tea breaks when recording round the corner at Trident Studios in St Anne's Court. There's an undervalued song of Bowie's London Boys, written in his late teens and first released on 2nd of December 66 as the B-side of Rubber Band, that not only unalterably fingerprints Bowie as indigenous Londoner, but is seminal to his own lifetime identification with an alienated subspecies, a variant type belonging to a different reality, an alternative demographic fusing the drew delinquent sociopaths of Clockwork Orange to roaming messianic starmen. At the time of writing London Boys, Bowie was a self-identified mod, fascinated by the movement's immersive culture in fashion, pills, and trending music. He was also living with his friend and manager Ken Pitts at 39 Manchester Street, Maribelo, back of Fitzrovia. Bowie's close relationship with Ken Pitts immediately sharpened pointers to his bisexuality, his older guardian and mentor being openly gay, and his protégé, androgynously beautiful. In his account of the five years they spent together, Ken Pitt writes that the first time he saw Bowie on stage at the Marquis on Sunday, April the 17th, 1966. Quote from Ken Pitt, From my favourite position, leaning against the wall at the back of the club, I could see that he was wearing a biscuit-coloured, hand-knitted sweater, round-necked and buttoned at one shoulder its skin tightness accentuating his slim frame. I was particularly struck by the artistry with which he used his body, as if it were an accompanying instrument essential to the singer and the song. Unquote. The distinctly homoerotic focus of Pitts on detailing Bowie's jumper, its sexiness on his size zero torso, and what was the three-button fastening on the left shoulder, betrays the hawkish male-on-male -male design central to Pitt's interest in London's pretty boys. But more importantly to the formative teen Bowie, Pitt was a highly literate reader and book collector, his apartment furnished with a personal library, and was there and encouraged to do so that Bowie picked up on Wilde's Dorian Gray, Georgenet's Our Lady of the Flowers, Edward Bulmer Lytton's 19th century novel The Coming Race, as well as the dystopian futurology of Orwell's 1984, Anthony Burgess's Clockwork Orange, and the new wave sci-fi of J.G. Ballard and Michael Moorcock as urbane pioneers of ecological crashes, 
and the arrival of altered tourists from the future into our neural pathways. So to the cut-up, chemically-driven, non-linear verbal clips of William Burroughs' novels like The Naked Lunch and The Wild Boys, also fed into the young Bowie's ambition to compose musicals and write theatrical adaptions for the stage. But for Bowie, this was an unrealised theatre of imagination, given eventual form through rock configurations like Ziggy Stardust and Diamond Dogs rather than through concretization as a writer, not performer, for the stage. Steeped in apocalyptic dramaturgy, the young Bowie's sci-fi theme vignettes were managed in pop songs, a frustrating medium in that lyrics are usually secondary to the music, a regulation Bowie would happily have reversed. And on Ken Pitt's eclectic bookshelves, he discovered through reading the building blocks of his future personality swaps, Ziggy Stardust, Aladdin Sane, the Sim White Duke, etc., clones or humanoids, to which to project mini pop operettas. Back to London, boys, with Bowie masking himself as a 17 year old runaway, pilled up, sexually ambiguous as mods were, hanging out on Wardour Street and learning how to act cool in his chosen milieu sung in a flat, slovenly London voice, expressing a downbeat, fragile vulnerability, the damped, morose sensibility only thaws as the song builds with attitude into defiance. Quote, Oh, the first time that you try to pill, you feel a little queasy, decidedly ill. You're going to be sick, but you mustn't lose faith. To let yourself down would be a big disgrace with the London boys. Bowie flattens the vowel in London from an O to a U as part of the song's disaffected, raw digestion of street life. It's probably in sync with how he felt at the time, impatient to succeed but failing. What Pitt neglects to tell us is how tiny Bowie's audience was at the time of first seeing him perform, with one fan commenting on six girls in the front row and a dozen of us queens at the back hanging on his every movement. So, 18 people. At 19, this isn't a deterrent as self-absorption overwrites it and the future seems an indefinitely extensible platform. Bowie's extraordinary look was noted before his music and was to be integrally built into its increasing gradient of success. Its gay referentials were to attract both Ken Pitt and the mime shuffler Lindsay Kemp, each drawn singly to Bowie's disarming, gender-bending sexuality and the potential shapes it could throw at an emergent youth audience. I isolate London Boys with this reference to Bright Light, Soho, Wardour Street as a song preemptively anticipating Soho as Bowie's future workspace with Trident Studios in a cut-off Wardour Street, the modality where he would record the album Space Oddity the Man Who Sold the World, Hunky Dory, The Rise and Fall of Ziggy Stardust, and The Spiders from Mars, Aladdin Sane, and Pinups. The specific West One Grid was to be the hub for his explosive creative energies at a time when his ascendant celebrity as Rock's gender supremacist was at its stardust apogee. At 39 Manchester Square, Bowie adapted to Ken Pitt's decadent fantasiac leanings, the stripped pine floors and Victorian furnishings, the holly green chaise long finished in rosewood, and of course the first edition books by Wilde, Beardsley, Huismans, and particularly mentioned by Pitt, James, Bald- James Baldwin's Nobody Knows My Name and Giovanni's Room, all of which helped flavour the idea that he wasn't like anybody else, and so he would create his own versions of reality and his later assumption, I must be only one in a million on station to station, was another affirmation of the intellectually cold dissociation that so often defeated Ken Pitt's understanding. In later life, Bowie was to comment on his overt emotional freeze as, quote, I always had a repulsive need to be something more than human. I felt very puny as a human. I thought, fuck that, I want to be a superhuman. 
And of course that alien cold is in the depersonalised voice, flat off the atrocalised into ambivalent gender, as the narrator of Cut Up that keeps him at a remove from direct involvement in the lyric. In fact, after the end of the 60s, Bowie filters all subjective content in his songs through either a persona or sort of cosmonaut alluding to brain chatter in the universe. The methodology originating from Brian Geisen and William Burroughs of atomizing the self into quantum potentialities, fitted with Bowie's notion of multiple identities and not wishing to be fixed by the limitations, as he saw it, of rock. And while Bowie grew into a rock supremacist and inimitably androgynous icon, he always appeared marginally displaced in rock as an arts form that didn't collect him integrally, while at the same time not willing to renounce the celebrity, fame and wealth it provided. It's an arguable fact that most rock stars, including a luminary like Bowie, usually exhaust their creative resource by 40 and don't get better, but simply different. Something in Bowie intuited this right from the start that rock was only a partial expression of a bigger arts infrastructure latent within him. It was also in some weird way a platform to star men, or the beginnings of Bowie's identification with the alien as empathetic association endorsed by his first and only hit single of the 60s, Space Oddity. I'm stopped in my writing this by a skinny guy in a black zippered leather jacket and deconstructed jeans with knee holes, who tentatively tells me he saw me perform at the horse hospital with the ginger light, and the shift in time and place travelled mentally puts me in a bilocated window as I thank him for his appreciative comments. I noticed too the Thai girl sitting at the table next to me had new makeup and two-tone blended eyeshadow, burnt orange dusted into gold. And with earbuds in, she's in a split dimension. Her makeup's how I imagine Mars. I get back to Major Tom. Bowie's fictional astronaut launched through space oddity as an instantly durable counterculture anti-hero in the way of J.G. Ballard's subversive protagonist, Robert Vaughan, in the novel Crash, with Bowie Tom getting off on the astronaut plume of the Apollo 2 mission as the first manned moon landing, five days after the release of Space Oddity on the 11th of July, 1969. Recorded at Trident Studios, Major Tom's virtual space tourism seemed real object travel, and Bowie's voice pitched suitably off-world. So who is this Brixton interloper? Wised up on space travel, UFOs, aliens, time slip, futurology, and still without a hit record after three years of mutant pop experimentation. Bowie's opportune purchase on the International Space Program got him the top ten hit he so desperately needed after an agonizingly slow, long haul to number five by placing him in the parallel processing of London and the Stars. The lyric gets off modern, ground control the major Tom, take your protein pills and put your helmet on. Only Tom is a rogue astronaut who is off mission, but here am I sitting in a tin can far above the world. Planet Earth is blue and there's nothing I can do or anyone about Tom's evident dissociated self-destruct. But we got the blue right, as for an observer in space, the water bodies reflect the colour of sky that appear blue because of the way sunlight is selectively scattered as it goes through our atmosphere. The chart's success and realistic sci-fi incorporated into space oddity, the word oddity being equally applicable to Bowie in his creative quest, pushed Pop's frontiers into tech at a time when psychedelia's saturated colour wavelengths promoted journeys out of the body into neural rather than physical space. Bowie was largely out there, alienated and alone within the remit of Pop's acid pioneers reporting back from the future. Bowie was Tom and Tom Bowie as empathy swap, 
something perfectly consistent with his psychological need to put a character between himself and the song. Quote from Bowie, As an adolescent, I was painfully shy, withdrawn. I didn't really have the nerve to sing my songs on stage, and nobody else was doing them. I decided to do them in disguise, so that I didn't have to actually go through the humiliation of going on stage and being myself. It was this additionally layered disguise of first-person Bowie that built the impenetrable mystique integrated into his myth as intraspecies or replicant, but also basically glacial, cold-climate English, the formal reserve of Bowie's British generation of the 40s and 50s as generational characteristic. There's a photo of Bowie extending a handshake to David Hockney on the occasion of their first meeting backstage at Los Angeles Forum in 1976 that says it all in refrigerated formality. The divisive is psychological miles, charm, preceding gesture, as the distance he establishes between himself and Hockney with Christopher Isherwood immediately <coughs> looking on is the maximum attainable in physical space. It's quite literally alien contact. Emitting little physical warmth between two contemporary artists drawn to that perhaps suspicious of each other's magnitude. Bowie's Soho, where I'm writing this, extended along Wardour Street to the Marquis Club at number 90 and almost next door to the ship at 110, an Edwardian pub with chocolate coloured tiles dark wood panelling and stained glass where he conducted early impromptu interviews with music journalists through scrolls of blue cigarette smoke. There was also the Mocha Bar on Frith Street and tucked into Soho's niche yards Peter Burton's Le Deuce in lugubrious Darby Muse, a gay mod disco where clubbers threw their recreational pills into the aquarium tank when raided by the police. <coughs> Bowie's Soho topology, that was his geographical locus for the first formative decade of his career, also included practice sessions at Charlie Chester's Casino on Archer Street, or in a warren of rooms and brothels on Windmill Street, when Soho was essentially red light, as well as socialising at the Regency Club, a hangout for the notorious Cray Twins and their extortionist racket. Bowie and his mid-sixties band parked a military green Bedford van in potholed Ham Yard, its panels scrawled on with pink lipstick by early fans. Soho fame was right on the moment of what was happening. It was the epicentre of emergent British rock and youth culture, and Bowie was local but still relatively unknown outside its trending bohemian milieu. Photos taken on the rooftop of the Manchester Street apartment by Ken Pitt show Bowie with fashionable, long, mod-styled hair and deep collar button-down shirts before his transitioning morph into wearing dresses and full makeup after meeting Angela Barnett in 1969 and going trans for the withdrawn album sleeve cover of The Man Who Sold the World. As vibrant colouring to the often edgy, potentially violent Soho the nascent star man inhabited. I quote from Chris Moore, who worked at Charlie Chester's casino during this period for accents, aspects of B-side thuggery. Quote, There was a slightly dangerous side to working in Soho in those days. Heated arguments would often ensue as immediate entry was refused. The staff break room and canteen was above the horseshoe casino. I can remember standing in the reception at Charlie Chester's for 20 minutes smoking cigarettes and watching the violence in the street unfold rather than run the gauntlet and try and cross the road. <coughs> Chester's doormen were definitely of a different breed in those days. I vividly remember one of the crew being a small, overweight, red-faced man in his early 40s. He was known as Mick the Hammer, a nickname reputedly acquired from his earlier days as a member of the Cray Gang. However, whilst the pedigree of the Chester's doorman was undoubtedly dubious, 
They teamed together perfectly to create a hermetic seal from the violent undercurrent that ran through Soho in those days. Finish quote. But Soho also had a place for pretty boys in makeup like David Bowie and endemic mods who competitively swanked transitioning Carnaby Street fashion into gossipy coffee bars like Bar Italia, Mocha, and where I'm writing at Patisserie Valerie, surrounded by mixed fruit tart cognoscenti. It rains outside, and I'm reminded by new scientists it hasn't rained on the moon for four billion years. Four billion years. Bowie simply couldn't find a follow-up hit single to endorse the chart success of Space Oddity. But in 1969, he wrote his next interplanetary excursion with Life on Mars as another attempt at putting pop into the helium-torched high-tech plume of rocket science. Bowie described how he wrote the song, quote, Workspace was a big empty room with a chaise long, a bargain price Art Nouveau screen, William Morris, so I told anyone who asked. A huge overflowing freestanding ashtray and a grand piano. Little else, I started working it out on the piano and had the whole lyric and melody finished by late afternoon. Life on Mars that was held back from the album The Man Who Sold the Earth to be released as a piano-led cinematic melange sci-fi track on his breakthrough fourth studio album Hunky Dory while the track is not specifically about Mars, but more a blend of ludic surrealism with kitsch, cults substituting for politics, the plot suggests in Bowie's imagination not only America's unrest over Vietnam, but recognisable strains of universal psychoses that point to Mars as an alternative planet for migrant astronauts. So there is only a small symbiotic relationship between the red planet's rocky desert landscapes and thin carbon dioxide atmosphere and Earth's provision of water to transport reactive molecules like hydrogen, carbon monoxide and ammonia. Our collective consciousness has always targeted Mars as Earth too. And Bowie's song does that almost 50 years before the initialization of Mars One, a private spaceflight project proposing to land the first humans on Mars by 2024 as a one-way destination only. The selection discussions also introducing how willing the stringently chosen astronauts would be to become cannibals in order to survive. Life on Mars, which arguably would have been Bowie's ideal follow-up to Space Oddity, lyrically maps out something of his clockwork orange J.G. Ballard-inspired overview on dystopian themes. Like all fragmented lyric cut up, we know the meaning without the need for explanation. Having scorched Vietnam with the defoliant Agent Orange, America faced civil riot from its youth, and this violent turbulism was taken up in London too. But for Bowie, writing a song the process has morphed into an anarchic, imaginative documentation of potential futures that revisit us as wars. If the song got little attention on its initial release, then its reissue as a single in 1973 on the back of Bowie's Ziggy Stardust fame took it to number three in the charts. Mick Rock filmed and directed a promotional video backstage at Ells Court to accompany the record's release in which a heavily made-up Bowie, wearing a turquoise suit designed by Freddie Buretti, personifies sexual alien, or the characteristics of a new subculture species to which Bowie imagined himself integrated into the emergent Zeekist. It was this belief in being set apart that led to Bowie throwing political gestures like a Nazi salute at Victoria Station in 1976 as a self-designed instrument of gender-bending elitism. Of the dichotomy in his own personality, he remarked, quote, off stage I'm a robot, on stage I achieve emotion. It's probably why I prefer dressing up as Ziggy to being David. And it was the elevation of his impossibly high cheekbones as facial scaffolding that gave Bowie a Greta Garbo look something accentuated by his two mismatched eyes that weren't as often assumed two different colours, 
but the result of anascoscoria, a condition characterised by an unequal size in a person's pupils. In Bowie's case, his left pupil was permanently dilated. This can create the illusion of having different coloured eyes, because the fixed pupil does not respond to change in light, while the right pupil does. It was the disconcerted look this accident created gave Bowie the association with aliens or visitors from the future, a connotation enhanced, of course, by his playing the role of extraterrestrial mutant in the Nicholas Rogue movie, The Man Who Fell to Earth. Bowie's role in a film based on Walter Travis's 1963 novel of the same name helped consolidate the myth that his origins were off-world and that it was in some way an interplanetary plenipotentiary, something further enforced by his supernova arrival <coughs> with Ziggy Stardust and the spiders from Mars. The names, the names suggested an immersion not only in H.P. Lovecraft and Ballard, but a generation of sci-fi writers like Ray Bradbury, James Blish, Thomas Dish, Brian Aldous, etc., and the lurid Technicolor covers of their mass-market paperbacks with dusty planetary sunsets like the high-res shock tactics of Bowie's nasturtium red coloured hair. Sci-fi and the mix of French psychedelics was in the air, a generation mining Middle Earth, acid, sexual ambiguity, ufology, smoke botanicals, was awaiting its rock messiah, its liberated avatar in the form of Ziggy, patron saint of deviated glamour, urban apocalypse, and pushing personal boundaries to rock and roll suicides. New wave science fiction produced in the late 60s and 70s, with its focus on soft as opposed to hard science, had turned inward psychologically, and like Bowie, looked to encounter the alien on Earth. In a remarkable essay called Inner Space as the Compass for Creative Orientation, J.J. Ballard, as pioneering futurist, wrote, quote, The biggest developments of the immediate future will take place not on the Moon or Mars, but on Earth, as it is inner space, not outer, that needs to be explored. The only true alien planet is Earth. In the past, the scientific base of sci-fi has been towards the physical sciences, rocketry, electronics, cybernetics, and the emphasis should switch to the biological sciences. It is that inner space suit which is still needed, and it is up to science fiction to build it. And that, to me, is the premises of all good modern writing, the inner space suit. Whether Bowie was aware or not of Ballard's essay pointing the stars into our neural pathways rather than making them the subject of object travel, he was certainly influenced by Ballard's fiction in which urban landscapes, rather than space colonisation, are the domain of the aberrant psychopaths, rather than the reanatomized tribes of biomorphs native to real or invented planets. Ballard, leading into Bowie's creations in the early 70s, clearly saw that the alien was apparent in the human, and that sci-fi was now a reality programmed into our electronic networks rather than the resource of higher intelligence, theoretically located, say, in the hypercarbon lakes of Saturn's moon Titan. And by applying a sci-fi imagination to real geography, often located in the London suburbs or in culturally altered American landscapes, Ballard, in his seminal novel The Atrocity Exhibition, 1970, condensed post-apocalyptic excerpts of dystopian modernity, split by iconic images of John F. Kennedy and Marilyn Monroe into a bizarre synthesis of the fragile dissolve between imagined atrocities and realities. Using a method like William Burroughs of converting linear time into non-linear film frames, Ballard bounced narrative down into episodic vignettes in which obsessions of car sex, reconfigurations of Kennedy's assassination, B-movie psychiatrists, urban zombies, and the manipulable sexual images of Marilyn Monroe and Ronald Reagan occupy a confused, violent presence. The novel, A Blueprint for Crash, 
in which Ballard explores symphorophilia and car crash fetishism, provides some of the most innovative poetry of its period. And I see Ballard as much a poet as I do novelist in his use of implosive visual imagery that leaves most poets a very long way behind. I'm not arguing that Ziggy Stardust comes directly out of Ballard, but Bowie's persona Ziggy occupies the same sort of post-apocalyptic ethos, particularly in songs like Five Years and Moon Age Daydream, that invent fractured mini-narratives lifted into immediacy by Mick Ronson's guitar weaponry. It's Ronson's playing that provides the often spooky soundtrack to Ziggy's alien posturing as transgender rock star, and in some ways, we can credit the platinum-haired Mick Ronson of being the first sci-fi glam rock guitarist. And due to Ken Pitt having brought back an acetate of the Velvet Underground's Banana album at the end of the 60s as benchmark drug-stripping garage, Bowie was not only performing Lou Reed's I'm Waiting for the Man and White Light, White Heat live ahead of his contemporaries, but learned from Reed how to construct songs about the urban underclass and street culture written into the metropolis. Though certainly Ballard's visionary broking of near futures is fiction mixed with Lou Reed's cold lyric snapshots of the Warhol entourage at the factory, with the inspirational prototypes behind Bowie's scary postmodern fictions, seeming Ziggy Stardust, Aladdin Sane, and the most ambitious concept of all, Diamond Dogs. Ziggy Stardust as the human manifestation of an alien channeling extraterrestrial info, as well as representing the definitive rock star consumed by burnout and finally suicide, gave Bowie a persona that was bigger than him at the time of recording the album. Now 25, and like all aliens, including me, Bowie was a futures tourist, observed with suspicion and still lacking a hit to endorse his increasingly spectacular androgyny. Whatever the origins of Ziggy Stardust, like Vince Taylor, the tragically eclipsed rock star with whom Bowie identified, Ziggy is, of course, an amalgam of Bowie's own real and imagined characteristics, and in that sense, a clone or peripheral unleashed on the times, in the same way as Robert Vaughan in Ballard's Crash personifies the deviated extremes of the author's sexual imaginings. And the name Ziggy perfectly accommodates onomatopoeically our received notion of what an alien or star man might perhaps be called if we were to encounter an off-world contact. Bowie later suggested to Q magazine in a 1990 interview that the name Ziggy came accidentally from a tailor's shop, Ziggy's, that he passed on the train, and that the memorable name had, quote Bowie, that Iggy Pop connotation. But it was a tailor's shop, and I thought, well, this whole thing is going to be about clothes. So it was my own little joke calling him Ziggy. So Ziggy Stardust was a real compilation of things. Unquote. There's never any specific cause of an imaginative creation, whatever it is but more a cluster of dominant associations that synthesise in the process of developing a theme. Singular, but integrating, constellating motives as a plurality. Ziggy, dressed in brightly quilted zoot suits, made up by Freddie Buretti from sumptuous fabrics purchased from Liberty, or silk patterned dresses, camping it as an effeminate queen, polarising the attention of both sexes, launched his image at a wider public through his career-changing appearance with the single Starman on top of the pops in July 1972. For a nation of pop viewers, it was literally their first contact with a spiky, flame-haired androgyne, playing an aqua-coloured guitar, dressed in patched Liberty Ensemble with laced-up boxing boots dyed scarlet. The song a gentle pop rock, predominantly acoustic excursion into E.T. context, and preempting the Ziggy Stardust album, describes Ziggy receiving a message from an alien through the radio, the source of the signal from the spooky third kind. Quote, Look out your window, you can see his light. If we can sparkle, he may land tonight. Don't tell your papa or he'll get us locked up in fright. 
Bowie sings, looking again to children as more openly receptive to alien contact, and as a race set apart by active imagination and likely to be locked up if they express truth about a visionary experience. In an interview with William Burroughs for Rolling Stone, Bowie made it very clear that Ziggy is the recipient of the message and not the extraterrestrial carrier. In Bowie's case of third mind category, Starman, although released three years later and peaking at number 10, is the logical successor to Space Oddity in terms of chart and planet hopping his way to recognition. Made up as an intraspecies transgender rock purveyor of alien speak, Bowie was a uniquely untouchable phenomenon as Ziggy Supernova arrived as the leper messiah to an expectant generation looking out exactly for him. Bowie's moment had finally arrived. He put on what Ballard called his inner spacesuit. Patisserie Valerie at 3.30 p.m. The light outside's like a frosty green diamond. And the view through the window is like watching CCTV footage and the images are sharper. I took time out from writing my Bowie document by writing a poem to feed my addiction to poetry from which I can rarely separate. I speak to Teresa, a friend rather than a waitress, and she tells me that after drinking three bottles of wine last night, she fell off the stepladder while attempting to paint her ceiling purple. Her right hip is bruised and sore, but she doesn't care. The booze is worth the fall, and the DIY, a compulsive fetish, she likens to sex on an ironing board. Released on the 16th of June, 1972, the concept album Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars, the title sounding more like a hard science sci-fi novel by Frank Herbert or Samuel Delaney, as lurid pulp evocation of interplanetary beasts crawling across scorched Martian canyons, depicted on the covers of early ballad paperback novels like The Burning World, 1964. In fact, it's the dystopian, eruptive flame-out of Ballard's The Disaster Area and the Atrocity Exhibition that bleeds into Bowie's urban space boy apocalypse, and particularly in the potentous opener and my favourite track, Five Years. With the message come true that the planet is only five years and with echoes of 1984 incorporated into the package, Bowie's vignettes of condensed catastrophe were a first for pop. Quote, you'll all know this. A girl my age went off her head, hit some tiny children. If the black hadn't have pulled her off, I think she would have killed them. A soldier with a broken arm fixed his stare to the wheels of a Cadillac. A cop knelt and kissed the feet of a priest, and a queer chew up at the sight of that. Five Years is a rock poem, a story of mutant cross-cultures and defiant edgewalkers that belong partly to Ballard and partly to John Reckie's Hustler novel, City of the Night. I stay with it as Ziggy cites his alien contact, questioning and correcting what he sees. Quote, I think I saw you in an ice cream parlour, drinking milkshakes cold and long, smiling and waving and looking so fine, don't think you knew you were in this song and it was cold and it rained and I felt like an actor and I thought of Ma and I wanted to get back there your face, your race the way that you talk I kiss you, you're beautiful I want you to walk it's intensely moving within the context of the song how Ziggy perceives his alien counterpart who doesn't know he is in the song doing normal in an ice cream parlour or a Soho wimpy more like while Ziggy stands outside in the rainy cold. This is the moment in the song of cold alienation, the recognition of different races, and finally the physical union, I kiss you, you're beautiful, almost as an act of narcissistic conjugation. Bowie conceived of his star men as, quote, infinites or, quote, black hole jumpers, who impartially planet hopped across the universe, bringing news of catastrophe without any antidote or deterrent to survive it. Ziggy Stardust, inspired according to Bowie by Burroughs' Nova Express and the Wild Boys, 
was originally intended to be a multimedia theatrical performance with 40 cut-up scenes making the show radically different every night, the accidental accounting for the variant. In a Rolling Stone interview discussion between Bowie and Burroughs, Burroughs punched home the point that, quote, the weapon of the wild boys is a Bowie knife, an 18-inch Bowie knife. Did you know that? Bowie's sci-fi dystopian or conceivable nightmare future, a fusion of Burroughs and Ballard, is projected as a glam rock endgame, the terminal point of his own youth, as well as the near para-suicide of the planets. In the rocky, fabulous Moon Age daydream, Bowie morphs Ziggy into a polymorphic humanoid, a shape-shifting space shaman. Quote, I'm an alligator. I'm a mama papa coming for you. I'm the space invader. I'll be a rock and roll bitch for you. Keep your mouth shut. You're squawking like a pink monkey bird. And I'm busting up my brains for the words. Bowie was already discovering, much to his own profound disillusionment, that rock was arguably too exhaustively superficial a frame for the concept in which he was engaged, despite the fame it brought him. Although he was to pursue the theme further through the album Aladdin Sane and Diamond Dogs, Rock and Roll Suicide of Ziggy Stardust is a sort of predictive finale of his trajectory as a commodified rock star with an identifiable band. Writing these songs on which his own career in music acutely depended, Bowie saw himself as old in a modality exploited by youth. In other words, he was five years behind his anticipated expectations. Quote, you're too old to lose it, too young to choose it, and the clock waits so patiently on your song. You walk past the cafe, but you don't eat when you live too long. Oh no, no, you are rock and roll suicide. It's not overstating interpretation to suggest that something of Bowie literally dies in this song. The pop protégé Ken Pitt worked so hard to place commercially when Bowie was unable to find hit songs and marketable focus throughout the second half of the 60s, had experienced celebrity and overdosed on its negative aspects. Looking back on the phrase which the song opens, time takes a cigarette, Bowie was to intellectualise it by saying much later, quote, This was a sort of plagiarised line from Baudelaire, which was something to the effect of life is a cigarette, smoke it in a hurry, or savour it. At the time of Ziggy, Bowie didn't have the luxury of time, just the intense awareness of now or never. It's likely that Bowie's particular star man will never go away in the context of creativity, through which he is singularly introducing the figure of the alien into pop, and through Major Tom, the progressive reality of the astronaut brokering not only a moon base, but creating microgravity industrialised systems in the near galaxy. But for me, that trajectory into off-world demographics comes back to the song London Boys and Bowie's 60s Soho, with frequent visits to the Wallace Collection in Manchester Square and Pollock's Toy Museum in Fitzrovia, the eclectic oddity of which fascinated him to the point of inspired distraction. At the time, surfing the mod wave into its update of period revival dress and psychedelics, Bowie was a questioning outsider, quizzing youth culture for a place to let him in, but remaining peripheral to its hub, his ambitions too big at the time for his immediate talents. We can imagine him sitting in Bar Bruno on the lip of Wardour Street, breathing into a frothy espresso and wondering if it would all ever happen for him, soaked in pop hits, but wanting inwardly and compulsively to pioneer new cultural frontiers that linked literary fiction to rock. London Boy seems to me the existential start of the extraterrestrially themed project, finding its culmination in the rock theatrical Ziggy Stardust and the spiders from Mars. Soho again, Wardour Street. I finish riding and face into a mashed strawberry sunset finish over the Piccadilly point of Brewer Street. Writing about Bowie takes me back to Trident and St Anne's Court, 
still a dark twist on the Soho compass, but with a constant stream of foot traffic navigating north-south. It's rained while I've been inside writing, and there's a damp lick to the alley that Bowie would have known on rainy days, and that elusive smell of the city's wet skin exuding dirt. I stay maybe five minutes in thought, a sort of Bowie-directed zen, then hurry off for a drink. Thank you. Multicoloured, impressionistic, many angled view, which located Bowie so richly in the culture of his time and influences, literally musical, mm -hmm. personal, sartorial, the whole works. Thank you very much. Um, I wonder if people have any, any questions or things they'd like to me to pursue further. Yes, I think you said that um, uh, work seemed to get better as opposed to just change. Could you say something about his later work things in it that you find interesting? Well, in this little talk, naturally, because Bowie is a cosmos himself, I only isolated his Soho years and Ziggy. So everybody has their own favourite Bowie, of course, whichever decade you like. I suppose my favourite is his Berlin trilogy from the late 70s. But... Yes, everybody. No, I don't really know anything more about him than that period of his work, so yes. I'm interested in uh, knowing something, uh, uh, comments from you, perhaps you're familiar with the rest of his yes. work. Yes, absolutely, yeah. Anybody else like to ask anything? Be brave. I was wondering whether you'd like to say a little more about how Bowie's work may have influenced your own. Well... I think being an alien myself and having been the first poet really to put sci-fi, extraterrestrialism, science, etc. in a very modern way into poetry, Bowie's always been seminal archetype to me. The look, of course, um, the very ambiguously sex lyrics, um, the always pointing forwards into another place, another time. Yeah, it has been of enormous influence to me and of course I've listened like most of you here, consistently to almost everything he's done. Um, but, yes, his exceptionalism is what interests me. I'm always interested in another species, a race apart, um, because that's where poetry comes from. It's that form of, you know, contact between something which is an intelligence independent of you, which kind of looks after you, so you don't get beaten up in the street or anything like that. Um, and it's always there feeding you, so that's very important. And Bowie's sort of particularly with the beginnings of Ziggy Stardust, personified that. And before that, the early work, particularly around the London Boys period, has an incredibly human, lost, alienated feel to it when he's trying to find his way, which I find personally very moving. Thank you. Any more questions? If not, I've got, I've got another one. Yes, <laughs> of course. <laughs> Thank you. This particularly focused by what you've just said, one of the things that came through very strongly is the sense that what Bowie is writing about all the time, ultimately, is a kind of loneliness. Yes, an alienation. Yeah, I mean, which may come from that extreme shyness yes. of his early days. But do you, do, do, did he ever integrate with or commune with anything, or was his communion only with that isolation and loneliness? I think that's perfect, uh, perfectly put, Gravel. I think the communication is with the alienation. Mm -hmm. Like, Bowie is never involved in his lyrics. They are cut-up comment statements. There is no personal emotion, no work out of anything in a song. So he remains, in a way, the sort of um, star man spokesman for another species, for an objective future that's always driving forward. Um, you know, into songs like Speed of Life, uh, Another Place, Another Time. They're always moving somewhere where he isn't. And it's the same with my poetry. I'm interested in tourists from the future rather than the sort of Philip Larkin rubbish of what's right under your thumb. Um, 
So that's what always attracted me to Bowie, the sense that you don't have to belong here. And, you know, the alienation in his work, probably accentuated a lot by drugs in the 70s, is what is so fantastic about it. And I think if any of you want to go online and have a look at the handshake, handshake I described between him and David Hockney, with um, Christopher Ishwood in the background, you'll see the incredible distance in Bowie and that almost his arm is coming out of his socket to keep away from the person he's shaking hands with, which kind of defines his emotions in a way and at the same time makes that so incredibly alluring. Who is this man who came from Brixton and yet also simultaneously comes from the stars? And for me, inalienable to that... (coughs) is my great teacher in writing and somebody I regard as the greatest poet of the 20th century, J.G. Ballard, even though he's classified as a novelist. Five lines of Ballard's imagery delete most poets' lifetimes' work. Ballard is such a supreme genius, he can only be classified alongside Bowie and that the two are working together in dystopian landscapes but never separated from the human. That Ballard, as he said, placed... Um, all alienation on Earth. As Ballard said, the only alien planet is Earth and you adopt an inner space suit. And that's what Bowie did so fantastically, adopt the inner space suit from which to project extraterrestrial worlds. Um, probably in you know a couple of hundred years, visiting extraterrestrials here will listen to Moon Age Daydream um, because that will be right on their particular wavelengths. And poetry should do the same, you know, those poetries grounded specifically in the present, whereas the present is something you've left behind already to get into the future which you're moving into. In the way that William Burroughs always said, there is no true photograph, because the second microsecond you take the photograph, the person's already moved on. And you get that sense in Bowie's albums always, station to station, low, heroes, Right up to the next day, his penultimate album, this incredible speed of moving somewhere, which is the only alternative, perhaps, to the uncomfortableness of the present. And that, to me, is what is so great about Bowie, that you kind of see him, you know, moving along a highway at enormous speed into a future you haven't yet apprehended. And, of course, the look, which is sensational, probably the best-looking pop star ever in history. <laughs> the, the extraordinary face and the absolute beauty of the features is in itself an exceptional gift given to him to be exactly who he was, somebody set apart and utterly marvellous. So my way of reading. <laughs> yes? So, is there anything to say about Ursula Le Guin and always coming home? No, don't know as Le Guin's work, sadly, but I'm sure it's wonderful. I've heard a lot of good things about it. Right. It's a projection of a, a future time when all the industrial detritus has gone down in, in California. Right. And what is the novel called? Always Coming Home. Thank you, yeah. Yep. Well, that's, yeah, that's excellent. I will have a look at that book. We have just one more. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. No, you were. Oh, okay. um, do, do you think there's any virtue, more morally speaking, in seeking out and cultivating alienation, or do you think well, there is virtue in, in the opposite, attempting to resolve it? I don't think you seek out alienation. You are alien. You can't seek something. You actually are it. It's like you can't want to be a poet. You're either born a poet or you're not one. Um, and therefore I think the sense of alienation for Bowie is a completely natural characteristic. It's the feeling of being separate and apart which leads the work into an increase of alienation. No moral connotations are attached to alienation in any way. It is simply an existential state. It's a state of being. If you feel alienated in the crowd, you are experiencing an existential alienation. So... Does that help at all? Well, things which one experiences, yes. one can have an attitude towards to try to increase them, to decrease them, or to solve them. I mean, just the fact that something is doesn't mean it's, it, it's right. Or it's no, but if, you're, if your creative starting point is alienation, why would you wish to decrease it? You surely capitalise on it and work with it. 
because you know creative people aren't integrated into society they're always a step apart as well because that work requires a very special space and therefore you can't just be rammed into the crowd as a person in the crowd you are but you have to have that remove and I think that's what Bowie to a very large extent does so fantastically if we're not Yes, a resource, a resource. Yeah. yes, you're absolutely right. But for a normal human being, it could be a psychoanalytic problem, yes, I agree. <laughs> but we're not talking about normal human beings tonight. <laughs> what's, the, what's the one more question? One more, yes. Um, yeah, I was just um, going to ask about contemporary Soho. Um, yes. How you think Bowie well, might have responded to that and sort of thinking about it in relation to it your question actually, your, your answer to that question about how he would have, sort of, how he sort of had a, almost a comfort in being an outsider. Yes. And Soho is sort of increasingly somewhere that doesn't have spaces for the alien or the queer and it's, you know, it's got this sort of spectacular dystopic regeneration occurring. Yes, and that's I beautifully put. How you think he might have responded well, you know, there's a lot of Bowie's Soho, as I described, which is still there, of course. You can still go to the ship pub, you can still go to those places, but of course, yeah, the social context has changed radically, of course. We can't think ourselves back to when he was in all those coffee bars and places throughout the mid to late 60s and the first, say, three or four years of the 70s. Um, but yes, if he was alive today, probably like me, he would use Soho as a creative basis. I write there every afternoon because it still has a tang of the bohemian. It still has a tolerance towards people who are artistically different. Um, all of that. So, yeah, it would be very different. Of course it would. Incredibly different. Because it's become so commercialised and commodified, which in his day, it would have been largely brothels and just cafes and restaurants because it was the big red light area where girls were allowed to hang out on the streets and Piccadilly rent boys up the road also. So Bowie would have known that ethos very, very differently. Um, so yeah, commodification would have changed his views of it, obviously. But as you know, and you probably all know, about a year before he died, when he'd been diagnosed with cancer, he came back secretly to London in disguise to visit everywhere which had been on his map at that time. Um, Bowie was very good at disguise because he usually... If he went on the tube, he'd read a Chinese newspaper. Um, put on glasses and an old hat or something like that. He often said that he could walk out through the crowds queuing up to see him and they wouldn't recognise him because he was very good at disguise. And so if you'd seen a very good-looking man reading a Chinese newspaper on the tube, that would have been David Bowie. <laughs> all, all the very good-looking Chinese man. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Except he probably would have been in a crumpled hat and dark glasses, so he wouldn't quite have seen everything. But as you know, probably what, of course, is also marvellous about him, and we need to finish soon, is the fact that he, because his looks were so much a part of his creativity, he retained those looks virtually until the onset of cancer. The beauty of the features and the body, etc., were maintained throughout his life in an extraordinary way, which was given to him, of course, by some superior force to be the body that he worked with. I mean, you're not just dumped here. Everybody has their own incarnation, and that was his to be exceedingly beautiful. And he'll always be remembered for that as well as the work. Thank you. Anyhow, all of you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.